Hello, hello. Let's do a very rare uh, Saturday reads uh, at the uh, at the uh, Shea residence here. Um, the reason why I can do that and I'm not actually at work because I usually work Tuesday to Saturday uh, is that I had to call in sick on uh, Friday because uh, 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 delightful, delightful little niece came and visited. But unfortunately, she wasn't feeling that hot. And then she got here and she really wasn't feeling hot. And she was kind of coughing and and just not feeling great and wanting to go home to see her mom again. Um, but we got to enjoy the visit with her. But she did leave. She did end up leaving um, the Ill, the sickness behind. The sickness behind, which means I had to call into, call into work sick. And because I uh, work at a group home for for individuals with developmental disabilities that meant my uh, my manager said yeah you got to go and have a test hello Theo you didn't have to have a test you just got to play with Nova and have a lot of fun um yes so uh that's what I did today actually I you know uh booked that in drove through um because I guess maybe because it's Vancouver Island and it's just super it was just like drive up drive down into kind of the ICBC, our insurance company um, docking bay there, uh, gargle some salt water inside with my mat, inside the car with my mask on, gargle, gargle, swish, 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 gargle, gargle, swish, 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 you know, do that enough times and then put it in the little thing and then uh, in 12 to 48 hours, I'll get the results and oh boy, I'll get to go back to work, which actually is good timing because um, past today, uh, I'm it's my weekend. I'm off Sunday, Monday, so uh, I'll be back at work. Uh, and I, I don't doubt that I'll be back at work. I'll be the most surprised if it turns out that uh, what I have is COVID. Um, my, Aja is definitely down sick. She's in bed at the moment. Uh, but uh, both uh, my mother-in-law and I are, yeah, I've got a bit of a frog in my throat. My mother-in-law's got a bit of a frog in her throat and is just feeling kind of ti a little bit tired. Um, so you'll color me surprised if I some if I come back and suddenly go, oh my God, I have COVID, most likely. But you know, this is the things of you know working with vulnerable individuals. You do not want to go in there. You know, even if I just had like a bad cold or something like that, I wouldn't want to spread that to my the individuals and really, really would not want to uh, endanger anyone with uh, potential COVID. So <laughs> that's that's what I that's that's my that's my interesting story for this week uh as as uh all the as all the omicron and all that stuff ramps up but uh i you know i'm pretty chill about it it's more like ooh, i need need milk for my make sure i i, I meter out my milk for my tea so uh i i can because uh, i can't go out shopping until i get the results of the test which glory of technology i will apparently get texted me uh, with it from 12, 12 to 48 hours. So I just got to meter my, meter, meter my milk. And, uh, uh, I'm just, this is resting on a chest freezer. So I'm, I'm, there's plenty of, plenty of things around to, to munch on until then. So we're all good. So yes, yes. So let's do, let's do the reads. I haven't done this for a little while, but I'm just, uh, we'll, we'll dispense with various things that have probably come and gone since it's done. I'm continuing with uh, Michael Armstrong, Life and Adventures of Michael Armstrong, Factory Boy by um, by uh, by uh, Fanny Milton Trollope, uh, Anthony Trollope's mother. Um, it's, it, uh, it's, 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 it's continuing to go very, it's a melodramatic, very heartfelt, uh, has some questionable things about it. There's a lot of strong equating with uh, the treatment of um, the uh of, of child labor working children to death in this with uh the slave trade which had um when this book was written in the 1840s had i think just recently had fairly recently been um outlawed uh, slavery had been outlawed in within the british the british empire still obviously lots of other things around there but um a lot of equating which is like uh that's probably that's that is the step that is a step too far but um yeah yeah it's 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 it, that is continuing to go that is continuing to go well um i was definitely looking i was definitely looking for uh something something light to read and something that uh ja had actually gotten she has the audible account in the house and uh oh, doesn't show up there uh, the 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 um 
one of the things was uh, Scott Sigler uh, had um, he's he is the author of the GFL books, and actually he kind of embarked on a rather interesting program of like you know he's a commercial author. He's putting out a lot of different books and a lot of different series. Uh, the uh, GFL, the Galactic Football League, science fiction, uh, science fiction kind of big series that is all structured around basically kind of sports stories about this football team, but it's a football team made out of aliens. I won't go into the whole thing, but it's kind of interesting because he is an author, as a businessman, uh, looked at the James Patterson um, model where... Um, as as far as he as far as he describes it, uh, Patterson teams up with uh, other authors, kind of comes up with a um, a blueprint, a, a a kind of oh, there's there's Shira having a look through, uh, ha he comes through with a kind of a blueprint of how um, with the story, like kind of the um, the outline, uh, and the the author the author he teams with goes away, writes writes the book, and then perhaps James Patterson comes back in or his team comes back in and they edit that book and they make it into a James Patterson book, which is how he can crank out so many books at a time. And it's not like Scott Ziegler is cranking out, has, has created a kind of a James Patterson factory, but he was sort of inspired by that to say like, okay, I know. Ah! Trouble in paradise between the guppies. Um, not really trouble, but uh, Theo likes to visit and sure is not always super happy to have little have an ease batting in her face but so yeah he does these novellas in between the main installments of the novel which are co-written which uh and this one uh the stone wolves which is gfl 5.6 i uh, was published in this year in 2020 he did with uh, jc hutchins which it's to say it's a novella is is sort of underselling it it's a, a full-size novel i think it was nine or ten hours in audiobook um, so basically a full-size novel it had really ballooned, it had really ballooned out there. Um, but it's all these like little side stories. And actually I would say with, with Stone Wolves, because it, it centers on Quentin Barnes, Barnes's father. I won't go too far into it for fear of spoiling anyone who's still, who's, who's just starting out the thing, but his actual biological father, uh, and, and his team. Um, gets centered on in this book and actually unlike the other GFL books uh, this is very much seems like it, this actually almost feels like a standalone in itself in that uh, the father is a captain of a ship and he has his own kind of team and they all have their own specialities and they have they have jobs to do it's there's sort of a firefly you know heist kind of heist kind of quality to, to the book and uh, each each one of them has their own dark past. They're all on the run from the run from the law and their past and all that in their own way. And it was just yeah, it was just really really entertaining book. And it is one of those things where um, I think if someone handed me the book and said it was just a Scott Ziegler book, I wouldn't know the difference. And a part of that is that Scott Ziegler is a commercial author, and I think the signature of his style is probably it's got to do more with the pacing and the efficiency of the storytelling than it does to have you know that there's great descriptive great descriptive language you know he writes really clean propulsive prose that uh tells a good story and because he's obviously so involved in the actual story constructing the, the story that's going to be told by the uh, the other author um and probably kind of doing his own write of, of the book i'm not quite sure you know i'd have to hear an interview with him uh, it just comes off as a scott sigler book um you know, which isn't to say it might be interesting to then pick up a book by yes, J.C. Hutchins and see if he writes books in a similar vein. And what does J.C. Hutchins get out of uh, this collaboration? Uh, well, I guess that's between him and Scott Sigler. But yeah, I mean, that would be the way, thing that would get through as fans of Scott Sigler would then check out this other author's books. So that would hopefully benefit benefit that fellow. So maybe I should actually make a point of looking at it. But it's just one of these things of, um, you know, there's a lot of fiction, especially if it's literary fiction, we, we're, we're looking at as this is the work of an artist and it's an individual thing and no one else could do this. This is why you come to this artist. But um, there's a lot of other storytelling, which is much more collaborative, uh, TV shows, uh, movies, where, you know, it's a product of many people. I'll often most majority of the time it's a product of many people or, you know, like in this in the thing of like a TV show, there's maybe one overarching um, vision, but then there's a whole bunch of writers beneath them that um, 
that produce that produce the individual episodes that then get maybe get shaped or decisions get made by the showrunner um and we you know tv has gotten to the point where it's gotten respected enough as an art form in itself so it's 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 interesting just to look at a at a book which is it's a commercial book it's telling an entertaining an entertaining story um but that what the biases are or what are the expectations of the author in a single individual thing, which I mean, you know, that's the joy of a book is that you can have that individual thing and you don't, there isn't sort of the, just the, the industrial cranking out of stuff necessity that, you know, most people ki would kill themselves. And I mean, there are writers who write everything for like a TV show, but most of those stories seem to end with a person, you know, dropping <laughs> because of the exhaustion, it's not something that's a sustainable uh, model for pr the production of um, the the stories. So yeah, yeah. I just thought that was thought that was thought that was interesting. Um, I guess there's a bit of a, a series theme. I also um, picked up number two in the Matthew Shardlake uh, series, Dark Fire, which you, it's not. It's probably a cover that looks really wonderful in person, but uh, this is um, following yes Matthew Shardlake, uh, who is uh, in, it's in, the, in the time of of King Henry VIII, where Shard Lake, uh, in the first novel, is very much a uh, man of uh, one of one of Thomas Cromwell's agents, as Cromwell is uh, disestablishing uh, the church, the Church of England for Henry. Um, also, you know, Cromwell's doing a lot of other stuff, but uh, that's sort of what Matthew Shard Lake, who is a hunchback uh, lawyer, is doing. Who is oftentimes is you know very much cast as. Um, basically people judge him by his appearance like if you look if you look in um if you have a deformity and what 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 uh, people will, will consider a deformity well then that must mean you're also evil and you know it's the hunchback of notre dame kind of that kind of thing uh, a story that i have not read so i shouldn't probably go too into that but you know people people thought the hunchback of notre dame was a, a evil monster as well so that that sort of that sort of thing. So this book uh, takes place uh, a while later. Um, you know, he's he is a bit more sort of on his own in this book, uh, or at least at the start he is. Though Cromwell quickly uh, attaches someone else to him because uh, there's this thing called the Dark Fire or Greek Fire, which has come into play. Uh, it's the it looks like you know it's it's the uh, it, <laughs> it's it's the uh, basically super flammable. Uh, like a fire, like, you know, you'd have a, um, God damn it. What would you have? You'd like have a flamethrower throwing out, uh, you know, liquid, liquid fuel that would just burn and burns even on water. Uh, and indeed this was a historical thing that was used by the, I think the Byzantines had a whole system set up, but they were so secretive about it. It was such a state secret and they kept every, they kept all the different components separate uh, that the, the people who made like who made the thing that act the, the fuel were one component the people who made the device that could actually fire it were another the people who could actually operate the device were a yet another they, they they segmented it up so much that they kept such a good secret that the secret was lost uh, and indeed um, that's the thing that gets offered to Cromwell who is not doing well at this point with Henry VIII he is losing favor he is in on tenuous ground which because I've been reading, uh, I was reading uh, the bi a biography of Thomas Cromwell and reading Hildry Mantell last year. I'm very well aware of all of all of all the was it last year it was probably the year before now of all of uh, all of um, Cromwell's uh, woes and his his uh, dark, violent <laughs> kind of ways as well. Um, you know, on all sides of of the pro uh, the, the the pro Catholic and the the, the rising what's going to turn into uh, Protestant Protestantism uh, on the other side, um, but um, Cromwell's offered this new weapon, uh, except that the people who are going to sell it turn up dead. So he uh, Cromwell Cromwell pulls pulls Shardlake, who's been trying to kind of distance himself. He's thinking about even getting out of London. Pulls him back in, says, "You have to do this for me, and you do not say no to Cromwell." At the same time. There is a girl who has been accused of uh, pushing kind of the golden boy son of this family that she uh, 
she's a relation of that has, she's gone to because her parents have died, and has pushing them, pushing them down a well and killing him. But she refuses to talk about it. She refuses to speak. And uh, a uncle has come in and asked Shard Lake to uh, try and figure out what the hell's going on there. And so these two stories kind of weave their way in between. And Shard Lake is a really great character. Um, there's a stuff with his horse in this book, which are, is completely heartbreaking, which I think uh, is an interesting thing in a book, which you have all these other deaths. It's like, you know, forget I said that. God, I probably won't even release this now because I said that. God damn it. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, <sighs> whatever. Um, and finally, uh, I was, I've been reading uh, on audiobook, listening on audiobook to T.L. Who choose uh, the Library of the Dead, uh, a, uh, a a 2020 novel set in, 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 in a kind of a future Edinburgh, a future kind of post-apocalyptic, a soft apocalyptic Edinburgh uh, by uh, this Zimbabwean author who actually now lives in uh, Edinburgh as a certified pod podiatrist. Um, uh, it's um, and uh, it's it's. It, it focuses on Ropa, who is this uh, young girl, she's almost 15, she's almost 15, who um, is a ghost stalker, who uh, basically uh, delivers messages back and forth between the dead and the living for money. She ain't, ain't no run, running no, no um, charity here. Um, and uh, who... Uh, who uh, has, uh, you know, as it, her 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 grandmother, her granny is a is a, is a um, so, so it, from from the uh, sounds like she's probably from Dr Zimbabwe directly. She's um, the audiobook. You have her definitely speaking in kind of a Zimbabwean accent, where Ropa has very much the Edinburgh Edinburgh accent, which I will not do uh, or try to butcher um, um, here um, and. Uh, she also has a friend who works at a library, and uh, she and we. I've just entered the part where she's getting introduced to this library, and indeed seems to immediately step right into it and get into it. So I'm really enjoying that, and I'm, I'm enjoying that the book, uh, maybe because I'm, I was I was listening I was listening to David Attenborough's uh, book uh, A Life on Our Planet uh, recently. Um, the thing of like, yeah, the roads are gone. Um, power is, is 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 solar uh things are really fallen i uh, think people there's been great crazes where people have scavenged all the metal they can find you you get this sense that this is a um post industrial collapse post environmental collapse um world that um they're struggling in um mixed with this kind of these magical this magical elements of uh of of stuff with the afterlife uh, and ghosts that um, you know most would would go on, will go on, uh, but some stick around because they have messages. Uh, and uh, indeed, there's a particular ghost that stuck around because this ghost is super concerned about her child who's gone missing. Uh, and we're soon we're soon getting all this stuff of many children who seem to have gone missing, or you know bad things have happened to, uh, and. Uh, yeah, so that's 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 been that's an that's been an interesting interesting book. Uh yeah, T. L. Huchu, who is uh Tendi Huchu, uh who uh, he's he's written written I think this is his like third novel. His first one was in uh twenty ten. Um and I'm not quite sure if it's because this is more of a genre e novel and uh that he I think or whether the other books are genre as well, I'll have to look into that. It's an, always interesting when somebody goes from like you know, Tendi Huchu to T L Huchu. It's like you know, what were the, what were the uh, the reasons behind uh, switching to the T L? I know sometimes sometimes male authors go to initials because they want to slightly kind of ally the fact that they're male that will actually allow them to reach more uh, female genre readers uh, or not. Or you know, I that's me just speculating. I have no idea. I have no idea what's behind it. Maybe it's just yeah. Maybe it's just a little bit of a rebrand to kind of. Uh, continue continue going on since like yeah he's his he, yeah yeah so that's that's what I've been reading this week that's what's been going on in the, uh, the Shea household I can yeah I've got that frog little frog in my throat but it's doing okay at the moment everybody is just just taking it easy
Just taking it easy. Right, Shira? Oh, Shira. <laughs> okay, more videos later.